In Front Page Challenge, Canada had its first panel show hit. But a controversy south of the border led to an unraveling chain of events that would make Canada a home for great game shows. There was very little supervision of game shows in the United States. The game show that started the whole scandal of game shows was a show called 21. It, it really did take the country by storm, and who was winning and who was losing were important things to people. Then it turned out that the shows were rigged. As the 1950s began to unfold, they began turning more and more into shows, and that was when the big money quiz shows came along. The 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, yes, the $64,000 question. 21 was NBC's answer to the very, very successful $64,000 question on CBS. There's always a difference, too. You, you have quiz shows and you have game shows, and games of chance are there. Quiz shows are based on knowledge. Game shows in the 50s are tied, at least in my mind, to the launch of Sputnik. And the whole idea that the Soviets had outperformed the U.S. was intolerable. So suddenly there was nothing but money for science and for education in general because we were going to beat the Soviets. And so game shows were a natural outgrowth of that. Previously, you had these shows where the, where the prizes were prizes, but they weren't life-changing. Suddenly now, they amped them up massively. Jack Berry and Dan Enright had a production company called Berry and Enright Productions, and they were the executive producers of a number of successful shows. And then when the big money craze hit, like any other good producer does, you try to get in on that, and they were looking for a big money quiz show that they could put on the air. And they came up with a show called 21, which was very loosely based on the game of blackjack, except they went without cards. The premise of 21 was you'd have two contestants in isolation booths because the $64,000 question had one isolation booth, so this is going to have double the number of isolation booths. Much better television. You would choose what value question you'd have to answer in order to get to 21. Here's where things go wrong. The first episode of 21 was played legitimately. It was a disaster. They had two contestants who played the game not particularly well, and they answered 17 straight questions incorrectly. And the audience is laughing at the contestants for how badly the game is going. What happened in the old days of television was a sponsor was responsible for bankrolling the entire show. 21 has been brought to you by Geritol, America's number one tonic, and Geritol Jr. Geritol was the voice in charge of 21, and the executives of Geritol said, do not give us a show that bad again. And that was when the decision was made to begin rigging the show. It was the networks, it was the client Geritol that forced this young man into doing something that under other set of circumstances, he probably wouldn't have done. A contestant named Herbert Stemple, who came out of the army, who the producers, Enright and Barry, thought would be a great winning contestant. So not only did they necessarily help him with answers, they dressed him. He was instructed to get a military-style crew cut, get some horn rim glasses, and he was given a new wardrobe of suits, and intentionally none of the suits fit him correctly. Because Dan Enright wanted to create this image of a very awkward, robotic, off-putting nerd, and build him up as kind of a villain, the human trivia machine who could not be stumped and would just kind of drive the audience up a wall. He was getting a little tough to deal with, but a scholarly gentleman named Charles Van Doren from the Van Doren family, eventually got onto the show. Charles Van Doren, a very handsome, very charismatic, very likable presence, who was very, very witty and made it look appealing to be very intelligent. A uh, critic uh, referred to him as the safe Elvis. And they expressed to him how they would want him to be champion. And finally he said, okay, he would play along. And the Stemple Van Doren fight went on for a number of weeks until Van Doren finally won. It was like wrestling. Herb Stemple agreed to take a dive on the promise that he would be a panelist on a new game show that Barry and Enright were developing. Charles Van Doren goes on to win the game, and Herb Stemple was a little surprised at how he was cast aside. For one thing, the panel show goes on the air, but Herb Stemple doesn't get the call, so he's not on the panel of that. 
And the other thing that he took the wrong way was Charles Van Doren ended up being kind of a media sensation to a degree that Herb Stemple absolutely wasn't. Jack Berry said something that Herb Stemple took as a slight to him. Uh, Jack Berry said that Charles Van Doren was not a freak with a sponge memory. And not naming Herb Stemple, but Stemple took that to be a slight at him. Herb Stemple was threatening to go to the press. It wasn't that that caused the first chink in the armor. There was a show called Dotto, and a contestant was waiting to go on in the green room. And she's keeping to herself and reading from a composition notebook. And some of the contestants just kind of curiously ask, hey, what are, you, what are you looking at? And she says, oh, I'm studying for a test. I'm a student. And, oh, OK. So she goes on stage to play her game, and a standby contestant named Edward Hilgemeyer goes over and picks up the notebook, and he opens it up, and they've got a monitor playing the show that's in progress, that's airing live. It is a list of the correct answers to the questions that she's being asked at that moment, and he realizes he's able to follow along with this game like it's a script. The contestant went in, found the book, saw the answers, and went to the government. Suddenly, that drew a lot of new light on Herb Stemple's allegations about 21, and 21 kind of withered away. And that led to the congressional hearings in Washington where they decided what's to be done about the quiz shows. Scandal of the year, the television quiz show fraud with Charles Van Doren, the pivotal figure. And here was the crazy part about the whole thing. No laws had been broken. It hadn't occurred to anyone that you could rig a quiz show, so there was no law in the book that said that you couldn't do that. They were the toast of the industry. And um, suddenly, you know, they were pariahs and people would cross the street rather than run into them. And in a real sense, they took the fall, okay, because everybody was rigging. You know, it wasn't new, it wasn't, it wasn't strange. Robert Redford said that uh, it was sort of the beginning of the end of innocence in American television. This was the first time that a show that millions of people watched was shown as being deceptive. That also came in a stream of historical disappointments. The Rosenbergs, who had sold the hydrogen bomb to the Soviets, McCarthy hearings, created an atmosphere where something like the fixing of quiz shows was seen as a cardinal sin. And my own life changed, but my father's life changed radically. He'd been exiled. In the United States, game show kingpins Jack Berry and Dan Enright had been completely blacklisted from American television. But their loss was Canada's gain. Canada needed hit shows. They needed new ideas. They needed producers who had experience doing things that had pizzazz and that could reach large audiences. Dan was blackballed and blacklisted in America and couldn't produce anything. And that was his biz. So where did he go? He turned to Canada. You could take away employment opportunities from them in America, but you could not take away the fact that they had a successful background as producers. And Canada needed producers with that kind of experience. Canada was still blooming. These people came to Canada and taught us how to do shows. As a young producer, meeting Dan was uh, quite intimidating. I mean, we knew about his background. I was really involved with these guys, but especially Dan Enright, because he was there all the time. He was an intense guy. He, uh, it was from the old school. He would give you a swat when you were doing something wrong. They had an amazing opportunity, but it didn't come free, <laughs> okay? It didn't come free, because he was tough. You know, he was hard to work for. He was demanding, and he could be volatile, but they were learning. He had a number of young people working with him. So we're like a little group of young guys who uh, were learning at the knee of Dan Enright. If you were destined to be or wanted to be a game show producer, you probably couldn't do much better than, than that experience. He'd shut his eyes. To us, it looked like he was nodding off. But if he heard something that he didn't like, his eyes would spring open and he'd say, what? You know, he would challenge you on it, so he was listening to absolutely everything. A lot of those guys went on to produce, you know, significant Canadian game shows. He could be very encouraging at the same time. Once you got to know him, we saw the soft and very kind and sweet side behind him. He treated me like a son. What I learned from those fellas was how to make a game show, how to work with crews, how to work on a very, very tight budget, and that was a good lesson for working in Canada. What you have to do after you're involved in one of these events is go wander around in some sort of version of the desert for some period of time. 
and then, you know, they'll let you come back some, maybe. In the 1970s, Jack Berry and Dan Enright would finally get their shot to return to the American limelight. But their dark past never fully went away, and the scandal returned to the public eye when it was depicted in the film Quiz Show, directed by Robert Redford. The only sad thing about that film at the end, and I remember this really strongly, and they rolled as part of the credits, uh, just small little clips of uh, where each of those individuals that you had watched were and where their careers took them. And when we got to Dan Enright, it said that uh, he and his partner Jack Barry had gone on to make millions of dollars in the game show business with a show called The Joker's Wild. And the audience booed. And it sort of hurt me because they didn't know the man. I sort of get it. If I, as a young producer starting out, he was not an evil man. My father was haunted by his fall for his whole life. Thanks to Barry, Enright, and other famed international producers who imparted their wisdom, Canada was ready. Ready to create some of the most memorable games ever. Ready to feature some of the all-time great hosts. And ready to write its own game show history. There would be peaks, and there would be pitfalls. But one thing's for sure. Behind every game show, there's a story. So join us next time on The Search for Canada's Game Shows.